Well, good morning, Oakwood. Welcome to part two of a series we started last week um, called a Holiday Prep. Prepping our relationships for the holidays, prepping uh, your uh, relationships for the most wonderful time of the year. Because Satan's plan is to strain relationships. It's been his plan from the very beginning, even going back to the garden. His, his first goal is to strain the relationship that we have with Almighty God. And then his second goal is to strain the relationships that we have with people that are made in his image, whether that be our family members, whether that would be our friends, your immediate family that you live with your household in, uh, maybe your extended family that you're going to see over the next couple of months. And that is his game plan. And so the Bible speaks much to these relationships, gives us a whole lot of feedback on how we are to live, especially as saved, redeemed people. And that's what we're going to be looking at over the next several weeks is the relationships and what, what the Bible has to teach us about that. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. If you would turn there. If you uh, don't have a paper Bible, there's one provided for you around the seat there. But you're always welcome to uh, jump on with your phone, your iPad, your tablet, download the Oakwood app. And if you go to sermon notes, all of the notes for the message are there for you, all the scriptures, and, and um, there's even a way for you to take notes in there and save them. So we encourage you to engage the Word of God. I find that we are better when we interact with the Word of God. When someone's uh, pre preaching a sermon, I always like to follow along in the app or follow along in my Bible. There's something about reading it, thinking about it. Um, if you're like me, I highlight, I underline stuff in my Bible, things that jump out of me, take notes and keep a file of notes somewhere, go back and reference those. So, And just in the spirit of last week, we talked about um, what we were to do with communication. That's where we began last week. And today we're going to even go further into communication, talking specifically about our words and our language. The title of today's message is Words That Rot Not. And you'll understand the context, context of that in just, just a minute. Last week we looked at James chapter 1, verses 19 through 22. And I told you as a theme in the book of James, this idea of the tongue. And that the tongue can really get us in a lot of trouble, that the tongue uh, sometimes can, start, can, can be like a spark that sets a whole forest on fire, all the trouble that it can cause. And that was a theme in James' writing, but it's also a theme in Paul's writing as he addresses the speech that we have and how we need to bring that under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Last week, we learned about our communication is that we need to first be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow in our response, and slow to become angry and reminding ourselves that in our anger, we do not want to sin. And today we're going to be talking even more about the application of our words and our thoughts in that process. Now, most of the time, I think that everybody reads the scripture and you agree with it. You're like, yes, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. It's the application of it that we struggle with. It's not even necessarily the understanding. In fact, today's message from Ephesians chapter 4, I don't think there's anything that you're going to be like, wow, I never thought of that. Wow, that wasn't apparent to me until I, I, I read it today and Eric explained it a little bit. I, you know, I just wasn't, I, I just didn't even understand it. It's not the understanding maybe that is the problem. It's the application of the text to our lives. And that we would actually feel convicted in our hearts and allow the Holy Spirit's work to happen in us, to change us, to transform us. And to help us to live out the truths that were taught from God's word. So let's remember that as we, we uh, go forward. And just remember also the, the heart of this is that the brokenness and pain of relationships might change for you as we prepare for the holidays for the next couple of months. Actually, it begins tonight with light the night. So it's going to be awesome. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to begin with verse 29. Ephesians 4, 29. And this is what it says. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Let that sink in. That, that word unwholesome, if you go back to the original uh, language that the Bible is written in, it gives us this idea of rotten garbage. So think of it like this. Do not let any rotten garbage talk come out of your mouths. But only what is helpful for, for doing what? For building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That, that even people that are, that are listening and taking us to heart, that they would benefit from the words that you're using. Verse 30, 
It seems to go really deep. It it says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Man, it seems like it it got really deep really fast. But, But think about what he's saying here. He's saying that when you sin and you miss the mark and you sin against God, you're actually grieving the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Jesus died to save you from that sin that you're now committing or that you're now recommitting. And it actually grieves him because of that. And so don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is good for building up others according to their needs. And then we get to verse 31. And verse 31 gives us this list. And it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. That's some heavy-duty stuff there. And then he gives us this other list in verse 32, kind of the antithesis of it. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So let's break this down. Let's talk about this. What what is this passage saying to us? How can we apply it to our lives? First thing is this, no rotten or unwholesome talk. Do not speak rotten or unwholesome talk. This is easy to find, I think, in our day and age more than any other time that I've been alive. Unwholesome, rotten speech. It's everywhere, all the time. Media, just just watch the nightly news, unwholesome. The political climate seems to amp this up. Social media, what, what is it that we have to get on there and rant about whatever injustice happened to our kid or whatever happened to our family or whatever happened at work today? It is this unwholesome pattern of speech. And it's everywhere. It seems to be even in the conversations that you have with friends. Maybe this, you, you have this conversation. It's always ranting. It's always raving. It's always negative. It's always about what's not right in your life. What's not right in the world? And it's always focused on you. And, and the way that you say it, whether, whether, whatever sin's committed through it, it's unwholesome. It's rotten. It's garbage. And it needs not to be said. Replacing it with civilized speech versus uncivilized speech. Many, many years ago, we used to have this thing. It was called common courtesy. <laughs> how, how courtesy, even in speech, is uncommon today, isn't it? I never lo- thought I would live in a world where I, I, you can't even see people that you know, are doing an interview on television or, or, or you know, talking back and forth that just do this. It amps up to this this, this tempo and this contentiousness. And the pushback here is that it's unwholesome. That it, it, it's not good. That this, this, it could be filthy language. It could be gossip. It could just be this tone of contentiousness. But this affects relationships. How you speak to one another affects relationships. I could have uh, somebody and have a conversation with them and say something a certain way and say certain words that don't build up others according to their needs and spin them right out. And then I can be strategic and use my words to build up others according to their needs. And it's amazing how that encouragement will build someone up. But when you are constantly finding yourself ranting and raving and passing along this garbage talk, constantly judging, constantly complaining, constantly criticizing, being a critic maybe of the world, being a critic maybe of someone else, And passing that along to others in the form of gossip, it's unwholesome talk. When you're sitting around the Thanksgiving table with the family and you're talking about, again, we used the example from last week, Cousin Ned. Everyone's got a Cousin Ned. And if you don't have a Cousin Ned, you're probably him, okay? That's probably, it might be, you might be that, that guy. So, but you know, everybody's got a problem and we're going to talk about it and, and talk bad about them. And it never leads to anything good. But we're reminded before it comes out of our mouth, there's something that happens. It's actually in our mind. We do this so quickly. The the way God made the the brain to work, it happens so quickly that you don't even notice it when it happens. 
I mean, you're, a lot of times you'll speak, you're like, well, I didn't think about what I was going to talk, but you did. Because your speech and the control of your lips to form the words and, the, and, and the, the cognitive part of it actually begins in the mind. We're reminded of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says this. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take what? Every thought captive. We, we take captive every thought to make it what? Obedient to Christ. Every thought obedient to Christ. Before you speak it, it's up here. And what if, you th- what if you took captive every thought and, and notice it says, well, I hope it gets obedient to Christ. No, it says make it. Make it obedient to Christ. Do something about it by capturing that thought in your mind and sanctifying it before it comes out of your mouth. No rotten or unwholesome talk. And then we get to the second thing, only beneficial in building talk. Both of these are are found in verse 29. In fact, let's let's read verse 29 again. Do not let let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. It it, it seems like there's this pattern, and as we go throughout the message today, I think you're going to see it more. You see this a lot of times in Paul's writings. It's this theme of don't do this, do this. Or this idea of put off this and put on this. Put off unwholesome and trash and rotten talk and put on beneficial and building and encouraging talk. And this is important for us to understand because this is a proven builder for people, positive, encouraging talk. It builds people up mentally. It builds them up emotionally and psychologically. It can even build them up Physically, there's actually been studies on this. This is well known, and it's all in how you talk to people. Are you known as a person that builds others up? I mean, wouldn't we all like a little positivity and encouragement from somebody and to actually hear it with our ears? I think, especially all the more in this day and age with all of the negativity and all the negative talk that just seems to to surround us. You see, you need to understand this. Christians should be builders with their words, encouraging people according to their needs. I was trying to think of some some good examples of this from my life, and and I've had many through the years. I think of a, a man at Dallas Christian College named Mark Worley, who, uh, he was just an encourager. I think of the president at the college uh, at the time when I went there, Keith Ray. He was an encourager. I think of my youth minister uh, growing up. Uh, his name was Bob Belts. And Bob Belts was an encourager, especially when the hard times of ministry come. He's an encourager to, to, to stay in the game, to stick it out, and, and to, build, to build talk. But one of the greatest ones that I can say, honestly, that, I, that I've ever had in my life, and this guy was just a builder with his words, was a man by the name of Dan Wilson. Uh, Dan Wilson was on our staff, and he passed away about five years ago. He was our executive pastor at the time. Now, some of you know exactly who I'm talking about. You, maybe you had a relationship with Dan. Dan. Dan had two stints at Oakwood. He was here in the 80s and 90s, then he left, and then he got to come back. But Dan was one of those people that was just a builder. He was a builder with his talk. And I can, I can honestly say I can't recall a time where there was unwholesome talk that came out of his mouth, but it was always encouraging and building. Now, Dan corrected me sometimes. Dan rebuked me sometimes. Dan was like, Eric, I, you know, that, that's, that's not the right thing. You know, you need, you know, there were times we didn't agree 110% on everything. That happens when you work with people sometimes, by the way. But Dan was a builder with his words. And I can't recall a time where unwholesome, garbage, rotten type of talk came from his mouth. And he lived this out. And I think that's part of his witness and part of this testimony of his life. And I wonder if Christians at large, if all of us would take this to heart and would speak to one another and to the world in this way, how things might be different. How might the witness and the testimony and the power of the churches? Witness and testimony might be stronger because we aren't the ones doing that on Facebook. 
We aren't the ones that engage in, com- in conversations that get negative so fast. We become builders with our words. And that doesn't mean that we're fluffy and lie. And, no, we, we, we were called to admonish one another and rebuke one another and correct one another in Scripture. But we do it in love. And it's not unwholesome in the way that we talk to each other. It's not garbage. It is encouraging. It is uplifting. And even in rebuke, love and encouragement come through. Beneficial. Then we get to the list in in verse 31. We get in this list, and and this list begins with the things that we're to put off. This list of things to put off in verse verse 31. Let's read verse 31. It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Put off. This list to put off. It is bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander and every form of malice. Now, you might look at that and say, hey, the scripture had commas there. Why did you write it that way with all the ands? If you go back to the original language, the original Greek here, that is how Paul wrote it here. He wrote it just like this. He says, you are to get rid of or to put off bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander and every form of malice. Now, that's not the way they write. They would write oftentimes like we write. There would would be a comma there. There would be a pause there. They wouldn't have to use a conjunction every time. I think Paul is intentionally using a conjunction when he writes this to, to exemplify it, to amplify it, to make it even more, to make a point. You know, if I just got up here and gave you a list with a comma, it doesn't seem as maybe assertive as much. But when I sit here and I say this and this and this and this and this, you see the heightened tempo and you get the emphasis on it even more. And I think that's exactly what he's doing. And he's saying, get rid of these things to put off this, these things. Bitterness, it, the word there in the Greek actually means like a bitter gall. It's like this bitterness that's deep inside of you toward another person. Then there's, there's rage. That rage word means passion. It gives us this idea of passionate hate, passionate rage toward another person. Anger is just like we think of it in, in our English word. Then, there, then there's the word, the word brawling. And it gives us this idea of violence, of, of like wanting to be violent towards someone. And then there's the word slander. Slander means injury by speech. Injury by speech. You're trying to injure someone with your speech. And every form of malice, every form of malice is just ill will. It is trying to injure somebody and hoping and desiring to injure them. Malice. And he says we're to put off these these things in our relationship, this list of attitudes, this list of thoughts, this list of actions. Put off these things. Get rid of them. The best way I could think to think to, to think of this was to throw it in the trash. I don't know how trash is at your house, but I don't like getting into the trash. Now, I live in a house of, of all, all ladies, okay? I like to imagine my trash is cleaner than a trash in a house of all boys, okay? I just imagine that. I mean, you know, I'm thinking if I have to go through the trash in, 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 in the kitchen trash in, in, in the house with all boys, there's like grasshopper legs and, you know, a rotten banana that's been in their lunch for three days. You know, girls don't do that. They, they, they throw it away when it, you know. And, and so I, I picture that the trash would be worse. But it's still no fun to go through trash. And don't you hate it when you, when you go to the kitchen trash and you're trying to get the, the food off your plate or whatever and you're scraping it with a fork and then the fork drops in the trash can? I mean, it's not like the worst thing. And it's so heavy it does what? It slides over all the napkins and it starts working its way down. And you start reaching in and you're like, oh, it's going all the way. All the way to the bottom, you reach your arm in, you know, you got spaghetti up to your shoulder, and you're like, this is going to require a shower now. And, and oh, it's just, it's gross. And you know, it's like, it's, it, it's our food. You know, it's like my wife made it, my, my, my daughters didn't eat it, but they, you know, my wife, <laughs> that's its own thing. Um, but, yeah, you know, it's like we, we made it, we reached down in there, and, and, but no one likes going through garbage, And I feel like that's what he's saying here is to put off these things that are rotten talk is to get rid of them, to send them off, to get rid of them in the garbage and don't go digging around in the garbage to bring them back. The worst experience I've ever had with this was at Waller Junior High School. I can't remember if I was in seventh or eighth grade, but I got a started getting my teeth worked on, and we had this thing called an appliance. Some of you may know it as a retainer, but it's a big pink 
flesh-colored plastic thing with wires on the outside, and you stick it in. I'd had it for just a few days. My teeth were hurting, something fierce, and I go to lunch, and I, I packed a sack lunch. I didn't really love the school's lunch, and I packed a sack lunch, and I had taken a napkin, and I put my uh, appliance, my retainer thing, in the napkin, and then I threw it away at lunch. Now, those things at that time were expensive. I remember my parents like, let me know, you know, this thing's like 300 bucks, which is like $1,000 today. You know, I mean, it's expensive. It's like, don't lose it. I threw it away in the trash. Didn't think anything of it till about fifth or sixth hour. A couple hours later, I was like, oh. So I get in the car. Uh, mom's picking me up from school. I tell mom, hey, I lost my, my thing in the trash. And she's like, oh, well, we, we need to go get it. It's like, well, no, I mean, like, it's in the trash, in the cafeteria trash. Like, gross. Yeah, like food and milk, you know, and stuff. It's like, no, we don't, you know, and they, they probably already took it out to the dumpster. Well, we're, we need to go find it. It starts to turn around. I'm thinking, no, 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 no. Okay, okay, if we have to do this, let's do it at, like, 10 o'clock tonight, you know? <laughs> if we go digging in the trash, because this is, like, 3 o'clock. Everybody's there. And I'm like, if, it's, if we could just go back. Like tonight to dig in the trash. So we get there, we go in, we talk to the lunch people, and they said, "Oh yeah, we do. We take out the trash, but you're you're the last you're the last lunch period, so that trash will be on top." I am dumpster diving with my mom at the time the school gets out and meals. I mean, all the coolness I had acquired in like my months in school are gone now is I'm digging for my retainer in the trash. And we found it, we actually found it. And I never lost it ever again. <laughs> Did not, I knew that thing was, but I started doing it after I was just sticking in my pocket. I remember it was like, no more napkins sitting on the table, because other friends did it too. I was like, nope, it's going in the pocket. And when I get to sixth hour and my teeth aren't hurting as bad, I'll remember, hey, it's in, it's in the pocket, it's in the pocket. But you don't want to go digging in that stuff. Do you know how gross that was? To, to open up in a dumpster bags from school lunch. I mean, school lunch was in there, and those cartons of milk, and they, they'd been out in the sun, they'd like soured for a couple hours. You know, it, just, it was just gross. Why would Christians go back to that kind of talk in their life? And stuff that we're supposed to be putting off and to put in the trash and to take out to the dumpster and be done with, we keep going back to it. You see, when we think about that visually, and we think about the smell of dinging through trash, we say, yuck, no, but yet that's what we do. And that's what Paul's imploring us to do here in this passage. In your unwholesome talk, fix it and give beneficial and encouraging talk. And your thoughts and your attitudes, before they come out your mouth, put off bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander and every form of malice. And, and I know that most of you are like, yes, like I agree, totally. It's the application where we fail. And it means that we have to change. We have to change the patterns of relating. We have to change the patterns of behavior, the patterns of how we react to situations and circumstances we don't like. And yeah, it's hard work. But here's the problem. Many... Many people give up on the process of sanctification. Sanctification is a big word that means the process of you becoming more like Jesus. Many give up on the process of sanctification, but God never gives up on the transformation that he wants to do in your life. God never, that never stops. Every day that you are closer to heaven, you ought to, become, you ought to be becoming more Christ-like. In your mind, in your thoughts, and in the talk that comes out of your mouth. It's a progressive work. And so I wanna encourage you this morning, if you feel like I failed, I backslidden, I dug in the trash this week, I dug in the trash last night to my wife. Whatever the context is, it's a progressive work. Don't give up, but do something different. Do something that allows God to change. Some of you are just in an environment of negativity. Some of you can't, can't do anything about it. It's your house. Maybe it's your dad. He just is constantly negative. Your mom. Maybe it's your sister, your brother. For some of you, maybe your extended family, and maybe you're close to them. Maybe you live and you, you live near each other and you talk every day. Maybe it's a best friend. And the best friend is just always about everything that's wrong. Everything's wrong. 
Everything's wrong in the world. Everything's wrong with me. And da, 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 da. That unwholesome talk. Sometimes we have to change the environment. Sometimes we have to change the patterns in our life, the patterns of relating, the patterns of where we go, what we allow ourselves to listen to. Sometimes we just just have to change things up. But for sure, let's do something like change or it won't change. Change your mind, change your direction, change the intake of your life. Tune out and turn off that negativity. Turn your mind on to things that are truthful. Scripture says to set your minds on things that are above. And not on earthly things. And when you change those things, it's a lot easier to live out wholesome talk that builds up others according to their needs. And so we have this list to to, to put off. And number three, and the last one this morning, number four, is the list to put on. We did the put off things. Now we're doing the put on things. And we're called to put on three things in verse 32. Kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. So we're putting off the bitterness, rage, and anger, and brawling, and slander, and every form of mouse, and we're putting on kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. These qualities are expressions, um, excuse me, of God's goodness to us and in us. These are expressions of God's goodness to us and in us, and as we are transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ, these qualities should permeate through us to the world. They should permeate through us to the world. And notice what it says there about forgiveness. Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. That is the root of bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, and every form of malice. Do you realize that? It's unforgiveness many times. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. It's this unforgiveness. And he says here, forgive each other just as in Christ, God forgave you. And so it speaks to this, how? How did God forgive us? God forgave you when you didn't deserve it. God forgave you when you didn't meet the requirements for forgiveness. Romans 5.8 reminds us of that. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't deserve forgiveness. We didn't ask for forgiveness. We didn't meet some requirements. And this is the way we treat each other sometimes in our relationships. Well, they never apologized. I'll forgive them when they apologize. That's not a precursor in the Bible. Forgive when they apologize to you and say they're sorry. Some people aren't sorry. Some people are just mean. (laughs) Some people are just rude. Some people can't see it. Some people don't have, you know, they don't allow the Holy Spirit to work to convict them in that area. That's that, that part has not been sanctified and may not be. And so your forgiveness of them is not contingent upon their behavior or steps or actions that they take. Some people say, well, they, you know, they never apologize. Some people say, well, they never asked for forgiveness. But while you were still sinning against God, Christ died for you. And what does it say? Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. It's hard, but there's no prerequisite from the other person. If you think about it, aren't you glad God forgave us that way? If the only way we could get forgiveness from God was that we had to do something right to ask for it, to humble ourselves... So, I wonder how our relationships would be different if we applied the text today. So, let's hear it again. Ephesians 4. Let's just, I'm going to read it through in its entirety. Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And if we could live this out, some of the pain, some of the stress that we feel this time of year with relationships that are strained, 
How might they be different? What would our relationships, what could they be like if we would not only hear text like this, but we would actually live it out and apply it? And how would it build the testimony of God's church? You see, the Apostle Paul, his, he writes in, in these, these letters, this one's to a group of Christians in Ephesus, and he, he writes to, to other places, and, and just a couple books over, he writes to a bunch of Christians, they're called the Colossians, and he writes to them, and I, I just wonder if maybe, if we read the New Testament as a whole, how many times do these things come up? How many times does the Apostle Paul address exactly what we're talking about today? Unwholesome talk and language and attitudes and actions of the heart and how we relate to one another because a lot of times that's a reflection of how we relate to God. And so I just want you to listen to this. This is Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to end here this morning. Colossians chapter 3 says this. And take in these words. Since then you have been raised with Christ. What is he talking about there? What do you mean been raised with Christ? You were, you were buried in the watery grave of baptism, just like the Kramer boys were earlier. You have been buried in the watery grave, grave of baptism. You were raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6 says. So since then, you've been raised with Christ to walk in this newness of life. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. I'm sorry, that bears repeating. For you died to those sinful ways, they're, they're put off now, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death Put off, get rid of. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to the earthly nature, to the old nature of the flesh, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. And look what he says here. He says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, past tense. You used to walk in these ways and how you lived in the past, past tense, but now, talking about the present and talking about the future, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Listen to this list and tell me if you ever heard this before. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Oh, I just read that in Ephesians. Do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with, in other words, put on, clothe yourselves with compassion, Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. Have we heard this before? Bear with one another and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone and forgive as the Lord forgave you. Have we heard this before? And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And we're going to be talking about love next week. And then he ends it this way. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Boy, don't we need that today? Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom through the psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I know it's hefty. And we all say, yes. Yes, that's what I want. That's what I want life to be. That's what I want my relationships, my family 
My friends, yes, I want to be a wholesome talk person. That when people overhear my conversations, it's encouraging. It builds up one another according to their needs. And I want to, when I'm called to rebuke someone, to admonish someone, to teach someone, to point out the error in their ways, I want to do it with such love that even though it may feel like a slap, it's more like a kiss because I've done it to encourage them, to build them up, to steer them back according to their needs. And we would all say, yes, but how? Let me read the beginning of Colossians 3 again. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. And then verse 3, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Do you understand what that means? That when you accept Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you die to your sinfulness. You die to the old life of sin. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. It's weird, the wording there, hidden. What does that mean exactly? You're hidden under the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And the blood sacrifice is so good and so thick enough, it covers you. You are hidden through Christ in God. And that's how the change is possible. And that's how, if you've been a person that's struggling with a wholesome talk, you become a wholesome talk person. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ 